This is the captain speaking from the bridge. Please be advised that we have uh, been notified by the Hong Kong public health authorities that a Hong Kong resident who traveled for five days on Diamond Princess tested positive for coronavirus on February 1st. If you have experienced any of uh, these uh, symptoms, fever, chills or cough, we ask you to check uh, with our medical staff. The situation uh, is under control and therefore there are no reasons for concerns. That was the chilling moment in early 2020 when the COVID pandemic began for 5,000 passengers and crew members aboard the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Guess what? The situation was not under control. They spent the next two months, many of them, penned up in quarantine, lied to by cruise officials, and terrified of the spreading sickness, chaos, and death. Across the seas, tens of thousands of people on cruise ships found themselves at the leading edge of a global emergency that changed all of our lives. The CDC has estimated that early in the pandemic, 17% of all COVID cases in the U.S. were linked to cruise ships, almost one in five. The cruise ship industry and the Trump administration put passengers at crew at unthinkable risk. And even the career experts like Dr. Anthony Fauci had some crucial missteps in this field early on. A new documentary examines the handling of coronavirus on those ships in the early days of the pandemic. Hell of a Cruise from filmmaker Nick Quested is now streaming on Peacock. You may recognize Nick Quested from his last big project. He was the filmmaker who had been following leaders of the Proud Boys around Washington in the lead up to the Capitol insurrection and who testified about the violence under a subpoena from the House January 6 committee. Now Quested is giving the mic to cruise ship passengers who were misled about the risks. Many had booked vacations well in advance and were told by the operators that there were no refunds. So they boarded and found themselves stuck in petri dishes on the high seas with no real protocols or outside support. Many American passengers were shuttled home on planes with infected people and without proper testing, enabling the spread of the virus back home. And even after the guests left, crew members on dozens of ships in U.S. waters were kept offshore even longer without pay or adequate medical treatment. An investigation from Bloomberg News found that at least half a dozen crew members died by suicide. Quested's documentary lays the blame for much of this on a disorganized U.S. government and a cruise ship industry he describes as deceitful. The main thrust of all of our reporting was why did the cruise ships keep sailing? When there was an abundance of signs, warnings, and cases that suggested there were enormous risks to continue cruising on these ships. Unreal. Earlier, I spoke with Nick Quested about his new documentary, as well as about what he learned from witnessing the Capitol insurrection. Nick Quested, welcome to the show. Uh, there's a chilling statistic uh, in the documentary that you've made, saying that early on in the pandemic, in March of 2020, 17% of all COVID cases worldwide were linked to cruise ships. Is that what interested you in this story to begin with? And how did you get so many cruise ship passengers to willingly share so much of their gripping personal footage from that period of time? Well, what really interested was, uh, was to drill down from that statistic and walk backwards into the personal stories that people um, uh, could relate to us. And we, we were presented with some footage from the Diamond Princess um, of, by uh, a passenger called Spencer Ferrenbacher. And, uh, you know, we, our investigation sort of started from there. You know, you think about the Diamond Princess, which is the first super spreader event. And we were fascinated because this is the first time we'd really come across COVID outside of China. And we really, the doctors that we talked to, Dr. Callahan and, and Dr. Lawler, really believed that we knew everything we needed to know about the virus at that point after Diamond Princess. But, but the boats kept sailing even when they knew there was COVID on them. And the real focus of your documentary is the industry, particularly Princess Cruise Lines. But pretty much every level of government comes in for criticism, too. Even Anthony Fauci, who seems to contradict himself with Trump over the fate of the quarantined cruise passengers. But even after the period your documentary covers, you had politicians like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis fighting the cruise ships to ban them from requiring passengers to be vaccinated. As a documentarian, as a non-American, how crazy does America look to you when it comes to COVID? 
Well, I think that the, the response was very disjointed, and you can see that from the CDC admitting that they underperformed at the beginning of COVID. There was mixed messaging on every level, and I think that the crude industry followed the example uh, of the uh, executive branch and, and of the CDC and of, you know, of the, the federal government in general. It was, um, you know, you've got to have a clear plan. And what the, for me, what was fascinating is the pandemic could have been an opportunity to come together as, as you know, a country, uh, as, as a world, and it ended up dividing people even more because this is the world we're in now, where there can't you can't both be right on the sides of the on the two sides of the political uh, arena. And amazingly, many of the story subjects you follow, people who were stuck at sea with no answers, who got sick, spread sickness, they say they're eager to go cruising again. Who are these people? Um, I know I think the world divides into, you know, there's a Venn diagram that's you know, narrowly occluded, but it's like there's people that like to go cruising and there's people that don't. And I don't think um, I don't think you can convince them otherwise. And it's not our job to convince anyone to do anything. It's our job just to present the facts as we see them. Nick, of course, many viewers recognize you from your testimony under a subpoena to the January 6th committee. You had embedded with the Proud Boys in the lead up to the insurrection. I'm fascinated to know how a filmmaker like yourself gains their trust. I understand some of them were fans of your earlier work. Um, yeah, so uh, I basically had seen the rhetoric um, becoming more and more polarized during the summer and... Uh, and then when the president uh, asked the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by, um, I, I called Enrique, and Enrique was aware of a film that I'd made with my partners, uh, Tim Hetherington and Sebastian Junger, called Restrepo, where we'd embedded with a platoon of uh, soldiers in the Korangal Valley in Afghanistan. And um, he, he said, come down. So we did and in addition to, in addition to testifying about the violence that you witnessed at the Capitol, part of your footage also documented what, se what seemed to be coordination between Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio and Oath Keepers militia leader Stuart Rhodes that we might otherwise never have known about. Let's have a watch. In footage obtained by the committee, we learned that on the night of January 5th, Enrique Tarrio and Stuart Rhodes met in a parking garage in Washington, D.C. There's mutual respect there. I think we're, we're fighting the same fight, and I think that's what's important. Nick, you've delved into the psychology of veterans in overseas combat previously. At what point did it occur to you that these domestic groups in America really are capable of significant violence? How should we think about these guys, given you spend time with them? Well, I mean, that's what I was trying to work out. I was like, are these guys Jacobins from the French Revolution? Are they brown shirts from you know, the fascist takeover of Germany? Or are they football hooligans? And in the end, I think there's elements of all of those things there. Um, but uh, uh, as far as why should be, we be concerned, I think we should be concerned about, you know, I think the, the thing that we should be most concerned is the, is the, the lack of... of of an accepted set of facts. If we can't have an accepted set of facts, we can't have a discussion about how to go forward in any shape or form.